Hi, everybody. This is Jennifer from Weinberger Divorce and Family Law Group. Thank you so much for being with us again today. Um, today, we're going to be discussing, as you see, how to divorce a narcissist. And we're going to give you some tips on how um, you can get through what can be a really tough situation and a, and a long road to tough road to hoe and a long road, road to go down. I'm really, really pleased to be welcoming back um, Virginia Gilbert, our, our friend and our, and our colleague in our cohort. Um, she's a marriage and family therapist. She's going to shed some insight on how you can keep yourself healthy uh, and sane during your divorce from your narcissist spouse. Um, you know, then I'm going to jump in and I'm going to give you the lawyer's perspective and hopefully we're you know, going to help some people who may be wondering how they can go about uh, ending their marriage to their narcissist spouse, but still maintain some of their uh, sanity when the process is done. And Virginia is going to help us with that. Um, so let's get started. As you know, we are live on Facebook. Um, so if you would like to, we welcome any questions that you might have. Um, if you have them for Virginia or for myself, please feel free, leave a message in the chat box below. If you need a little bit more privacy and you don't want to do that, um, please feel free to direct message us and we will get back to you as soon as we possibly can. So let's get started. Uh, divorcing a narcissist and we're going to give you five strategies for getting through it. And again, we're welcoming uh, Virginia with us. So. Uh, what's being covered, we're going to talk about being married to a narcissist and what that is like, and then we're going to give you the strategies to get through it. Again, I'm going to jump in and talk a little bit about the legal angle here, and then hopefully at the end we'll give you some time uh, for some questions, and we'll definitely give you some more resources. So part one, what does it mean to be married to a narcissist? Probably if you're married to a narcissist, you know that, but I'm going to turn it over now to Virginia to let you uh, hear her perspective on this. So Virginia, thank you. Um, thank you, Jennifer. And I just wanted to thank you for inviting me back. It's uh, nice to nice to be here. Um, so, okay, what does it mean to be married to a narcissist? Before I jump into this, I just wanna say, I think that sometimes the word narcissist can be used a little liberally, um, especially on the internet. And I wanted to just explain that there's really a spectrum of narcissism. So, um, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you might have somebody who's, you know, kind of kind of entitled or maybe a bit grandiose. Um, that doesn't mean that they have narcissistic personality disorder. I mean, most of us have some traits of narcissism. Um, but on the, the other end of the spectrum, um, people who sort of are disordered um, are they lack empathy and they're interpersonally exploitive meaning other people are a means to an end um, everybody's an extension of them other people are pawns and they have no qualms about uh, using other people to get what they want so if that's been the case in your marriage um, you your spouse has probably Quite controlling because it's their way or the highway um, and they don't they don't like to ever be out of control so they can be very very rigid um, they're combative they like to debate um, basically it's if, if you want the same thing that they want you're terrific and fabulous if you want something they don't want you to want they take it as like a personal affront um, because they don't see a boundary between themselves and you. Um, that's why if they, you know, do something that they should have remorse for, like let's say they have an affair, um, they are rarely contrite um, because they just don't think they've done anything wrong because they're entitled to have what they want. Um, they play head games. So th this is a big one. And, and the other term for this is gaslighting. So um, I think a way to understand this is that um, narcissists, uh, even though they, they are kind of grandiose and, and seem to have big egos, really they have very fragile egos um, because they generally grew up in an invalidating environment and they had critical parents. 
So they can't tolerate the thought that they've done something wrong. They can't tolerate that they have flaws. So the way they sort of keep their fragile ego together is they split off the bad stuff inside them and they project it onto somebody else. And if you're their spouse, that, that's you. So one example would be, um, you feel like your spouse is having an affair. Um, they're kind of glued to their phone and they're having meetings at weird times of the day and they're just sort of acting dodgy and you confront them and they are having an affair. But instead what they say is what, you know, you don't trust me. I can't believe you don't trust me. And I, I, you know, provide for you and you don't appreciate me. And I think you're paranoid. And so, um, this is because they, they, they are not the trustworthy ones. And so they're put, sort of putting that on to you. But when these head games, the gaslighting go on through the marriage and they go on about, you know, all kinds of different things, it can really sort of mess with your reality. Um, and, I, and sometimes spouses over time will really start to doubt themselves. They'll start to doubt their intuition, their feelings. Well, maybe I am crazy. Maybe I am paranoid. Maybe I really don't appreciate him. Um, so uh, you can just end up kind of very kind of confused in your marriage and, and on eggshells and never really sure of, of where you stand. You know, Virginia, I'm, I'm so interested to hear you, you say that. Um, and it's something I never thought about yet. There's such a negative connotation with narcissists, but hearing that they've grow, you know, grown up in um, a really critical and, and sort of difficult environment as a child. I, I, I'm sort of feeling bad for the narcissist for a moment here. Yeah, yeah, they, they deserve empathy. So telling that narcissist you want a divorce. Well, that's some drama. Um, and I will say, even even if the narcissist is the one who initiates the divorce, they'll they'll still get nasty because um, it's it's a blight on their record. It's it's a failure, and um, they can't tolerate that. So even even if they don't want to be married to you, um, it's they still sort of perceive it as an as an abandonment. Um, so they get very manipulative because. Um, they're desperate to sort of keep control of things. Um, so one thing that they'll do, like if, if you're the one who wants the divorce, is they'll hit you where it hurts, which, <clears throat> you know, will be custody and finances. So, yeah, if you try to leave me, I'm going to get custody and you'll never see the kids again. Or, you know, I'm going to make sure that, you know, I ruin you financially. Um, they might even say this if, they initiate the divorce. Um, it's it's their way of um, trying to remain in control. Um, they can attempt to bully you or your children into giving them what they feel entitled to. So, yeah, they'll try to wear you down, uh, giving them more custody than you would like. Um, you know, kind of threatening if you don't do this, I'm going to do that. They can. Uh, you know, one thing that's really sad in these situations is they, because they see the children as an extension of themselves, they can often triangulate them. Like, you know, um, let's say, isn't mommy scary or mommy doesn't really love you or I love you more, you know, in, in a way to kind of co-opt the kids into joining their side. Um, and they perceive themselves as the victim, which seems odd at first since they're such um, kind of big characters. But again, um, they don't see a boundary between them and, and other people. So if you're not on their team, you're the bad guy. Um, and the divorce is you didn't give them the marriage they wanted. You didn't give them the life that they wanted. And um, because they don't take personal responsibility, they need somebody to blame, and that's that's you, unfortunately, as the the spouse or the ex. Um, they they do feel very victimized. Yeah. 
your narcissist spouse and your kids. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, leaving the kids out of it completely and don't let them be used as weapons in the divorce are goals that you certainly want to shoot for. You can only do, you can only control your own choices. And um, the narcissist probably is not <clears throat> going to do this. Um, they're not going to put the kids first because, again, the kids are part of them. Um, and you are now the enemy. Um, so they may actually think they're doing the right thing by their children by um, sort of trying to turn them against you or getting full custody. Um, but what you should do uh, um, is obviously you don't want to let the kids overhear conver difficult conversations with your ex. You don't want them to know anything about um legal goings on, you don't want to leave your legal documents out. Um, and if your children come to you and said, you know, daddy says your, you know, the divorce was your idea, you wanted it. Um, you really want to resist the urge to badmouth your spouse or uh, become emotionally charged um, in the conversation. You want to be very sparing in the details that you give your children. Um, don't let them be used as weapons in the divorce. You know, again, it's a tough one because your your spouse is is going to try to do that. So what you can do is don't make them be the messenger. You know, if you have issues that you need to discuss with your spouse. Don't transmit those issues to your children and have them deliver the message to your spouse. You need to communicate with your spouse directly. And, you know, pick your battles because there are, there are certain things that you really want to fight for, uh, like custody, um, child support. But if there are things that are less pressing, um, and are going to cause a lot of conflict, think about, uh, and the conflict will hurt the children, think about um, maybe that's, that's not a battle you should fight, um, which is, I'm not saying kind of, certainly not saying be a doormat, but just consider uh, what's, what's really worth fighting for. Um, custody exchanges in public places, really good idea. I think people feel like, oh, God, it's going to give the kids a bad impression if, if they think mommy and daddy can't get along together. And, well, mommy and daddy can't get along together. So it's much better for your children to not see you together so they don't pick up the tension. Um, they don't overhear anything. They don't, you know, witness anything. Um, so a lot of people do custody exchanges at school, uh, which is a really good idea. Um, some people, especially if there's like a domestic violence issues, will do the exchanges in front of a police station, but that those are extreme cases. Um, or uh, do curbside drop-offs. Don't, don't go into your spouse's house. Don't have them come into your house. Like just make it very separate. Yeah, and just to cut you off, Virginia, I apologize for, for jumping in on you, but that, that last note there, we're, I'm definitely going to talk about a little bit as um, I, I jump in with my legal perspective, but those items that Virginia's talking about, um, curbside pickup, um, not speaking badly about you know each other in front of the, the presence of the children, all of these things can be written uh, into a court order. Uh, and of course, you know, everybody always says to the attorney and probably Virginia to the therapist as well, well, even, you know, if it's written down and it's in an agreement, you know, how is it enforceable? He's, he or she's just going to act, you know, as they, as they act anyway. Um, and, and that's true. There's, you know, no judge or, or therapist that's going to come sit on your, on your spouse and, and make sure that they're behaving appropriately. But at least if you have an agreement put in place, uh, you have something that you can bring back to the court to enforce and we'll talk about that a little later on. So um, I jumped in on Virginia. I'm going to move on and, and let her talk about our second part of our presentation, which is uh, her strategies that we wanted to bring to you 
for getting through divorcing your narcissist spouse. So Virginia, back to you. Um, yeah, so okay, so we've talked about the, the problem and now we're gonna talk about the solution. Um, it's really, really super important that you educate yourself about narcissism. Um, so sometimes you don't know how bad it's gonna be until the divorce process starts. And if you're with somebody who's, you know, kind of on that far end of the narcissism spectrum, you probably are not going to be able to have an amicable, amicable divorce. The narcissist is not going to ever get over the divorce because they need to blame you. Um, that's how they're going to kind of keep their fragile ego together. And they don't really want you to go on and be happy. Um, so... Despite what your friends tell you, you you just may not get to that good divorce, um, and you may have a really really hard time co-parenting. So I think it's important for people to realize that so that they can kind of grieve. Well, I, I don't get to have that kind of that kind of divorce that I you know had hoped for. I, I I'm not going to Paltrow, um, and that's okay. Not everybody can be that way, but you have to to grieve it. Um, and so you can accept the situation that you have and find out how to deal with it effectively. So I talked a little bit about um, in the beginning of the webinar about uh, how narcissism develops and what it looks like and why they do what they do. But it's really helpful um, just to read up about it. And there's if you Google divorce from a narcissist um, or uh narcissism uh just, just so many resources will come up online and there's also some really good books out there so it, it is very helpful to educate yourself um super super important uh to hire a family law attorney experienced in high conflict divorce so when you're having your consultations you want to ask the attorney um, you know, what, what percentage of your cases go to court? Um, you know, how often do you mediate? There are some attorneys that prefer only to do mediation or collaborative divorce. They really don't like to go to the to court. Um, that's probably not your attorney. Um, you, you, and you also want an attorney who understands what it's like to divorce a narcissist. Um, you know, if they say something like, oh, everybody says their spouse is a narcissist again, maybe not the attorney for you. Uh, you really need somebody who understands your particular situation. Uh, you also need to have the same policy with a therapist. You probably at some point are going to need a therapist for support during this process. And a lot of therapists, well, I would say most therapists really are not trained in high conflict divorce. They're trained in kind of the good divorce model, which is, you know, use your I statements and uh, flexible and you know, put the kids first and, you know, co-parenting. Um, and, of course, you should put the kids first, but you don't want to be a doormat either and the problem with narcissists is the more you compromise and the more you give the more they just steamroll over you so when you are looking for a therapist you want to ask them what do you know about high conflict divorce um what do you think do you think everybody can co-parent are there alternatives to co-parenting uh you really want to ask them how they would work with your situation and if they don't really know what parallel parenting is, or they kind of seem very stuck on co-parenting, or, uh, you know, I really know how to help couples work through this. Well, yeah, some, some couples do, but you want somebody who at least understands that not every divorced couple is going to have that amicable divorce. Be prepared to litigate. Yeah, so mediation may not be a solution for you. Why is that? Well, to have a successful mediation, you need to pay people who are capable of mediating. And in order to mediate, 
you need to have good conflict resolution skills. You need to be able to manage emotions. You need flexible thinking. You need to understand there's more way to more than one way to solve a problem. Um, this is not something. These are not qualities and traits that a narcissist generally has. Um, so mediation will probably fall apart. Um, so you need to understand that you may need to litigate. Uh, you may need to go to court. And litigation can be really expensive and really stressful. So that's not, you know, to freak anybody out. But again, you need to be aware of what you're going to be dealing with. Um, so because you're probably going to need to litigate, you need a family law attorney who is litigator who's comfortable in the courtroom who's very skilled um, and uh, also because spouses of narcissists can kind of feel beaten down and they, they've spent so many years doubting themselves it can be really helpful to have a litigator kind of guide you and be your voice in the courtroom because your spouse may, may be intimidating and their lawyer may be intimidating so it it you will feel a lot of support if you have a skilled litigator who's really going to fight for you. Don't show emotion. Yeah, so um, narcissists, even though they can seem very cool on the outside, inside, because they have that, that really fragile ego, they're kind of like children. Um, so. Uh, they actually, um, and, and the drama they create, again, it's sort of a projection of their own feelings. Um, they want to stay emotionally engaged with you, even if they're the ones who want the divorce. Why do they want to do that? Because they don't want you to go on with your life. They want to always be able to blame you. Um, they don't want you to be happy. And they want revenge. So... The ways that they stay emotionally engaged with you are frequently, they do a lot of cyberbullying, they send really nasty texts, um, they can play games with child support, they can mess with the custody order, they just do different things to try to show you that they're boss. Um, they want to always keep you off balance. So it's quite understandable that when they do things like this, you have a reaction. But if you show that reaction, if you cry, if you yell, if you lose control, if you get defensive, um, it's just your, your ex will feel vindicated. Vindicated, and why give them that satisfaction? Um, so you want to do your best to stay calm and disengage quickly. So you really don't need to respond to things right away. You can walk away, you can take time to think over an email, uh, but you want to disengage quickly because the longer you stay in some kind of conversation with them, the more likely it is for you to just kind of lose it at some point. So stay calm and disengage quickly. Adopt a just the facts, ma'am, approach. Um, yeah, so disengage quickly. Don't respond with sarcasm or try to defend yourself. The trying to defend yourself is is really a big one because you, you are divorced from someone who thrives on debate and who thrives on conflict. So you are just inviting them to disagree with you. Don't do that. Um, Take your pride and emotions out of it and pretend you're a reporter when you communicate with them. You really need uh, a strategy, a communication strategy. Um, so if, if you don't, uh, if you take your emotions out of it and your opinions out of it, you are communicating only about logistics and finances. Um, Johnny has a dentist appointment at 2 o'clock Thursday. Uh, Sally's science report is due on Monday. Uh, just keep it very basic. 
don't attempt to set him or her straight. You never will. This is huge because... I find that a lot of spouses of narcissists have spent the entire marriage trying to get the narcissist to see their point of view, to validate them. And, you know, you pick somebody who is never going to validate you. They're just incapable of doing that. So why go to the hardware store looking for milk, especially now that you're divorced? They're just, you know, you are the bad guy. You're the bad parent. Um, you're, you're never going to get them to have an epiphany. And I think also, um, if, if you are, if you are very invested in getting them to see your side of things, um, it's probably a need of yours that goes back way before your narcissist spouse. It's probably something that you developed in childhood, maybe, you had parents who were invalidating or you felt like you didn't have a voice, you felt disempowered. Well, you're going to continue to feel disempowered if you try to get into this um, kind of battle with your narcissist spouse to see things your way. So just don't, don't even try. Keep firm boundaries really important because narcissists believe that rules are for the little people. Um, they might not even see that there's a boundary between you and them, right? Because you're, everybody's an extension of them. And if you're not on their team, you're bad and they, you deserve whatever, whatever punishment they dole out. So because you know that they're going to keep attempting to run over your boundaries, You've got to be really vigilant about setting them. Don't get emotional about it, but, you know, uh, tell them, um, you know, no phone calls to the kids after 7 o'clock at night and take the phones. Um, you know, no phone calls during mealtime. Uh, uh, I hear that you want to have an extra weekend with them, but I, I, I can't swap weekends this, this time. Um, don't get into a power struggle over it. Just say what the boundary is. Um, be firm. Uh, you don't need to respond to your ex immediately unless there's a true time sensitive issue. This is really key because narcissists like drama and one way to create drama is things are very urgent. Like you you know, if you don't respond to me by five o'clock today, I'm going to take you to court. Um, and a lot of times this is sort of an empty threat, but uh, you don't you don't need to respond to emails right away. You can take a day. You don't need to respond to texts. You need to to really think about what's what's a true emergency. Um, this is also important. It's not that you're being passive aggressive, but you you are holding your boundary and um, they need to. If they feel that they can yank your chain and get a reaction, get you to do something whenever they want, um, you're just, you're just going to stay emotionally entangled with them. So also stick to any and all court ordered parenting time plans. Really important, especially if you have an ex who plays games with timeshare. Um, don't fight back. Don't try to keep the kids when it's their weekend. Um, because you will, if this continues, you're going to have to go back to court and you want the court to see that you are the one who uh, follows the court order. You're the reasonable one. And your narcissist ex is the one who's, who's violating the custody agreement. Well, that was, well, that was, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Virginia. Oh, I'm sorry, Virginia. No, no. Okay. Um, I was just saying that um, Virginia talking about the custody, you know, abiding by that is actually a really great segue uh, for me to speak to you a little bit. Um, before I do that, uh, we had a question uh, from Christine on our website, nothing substantive, but she's wondering if there's a way to get a copy of um, our presentation, Virginia. Uh, yes, actually our presentations, uh, Christine live here on, on the uh, Weinberger Divorce and Family Law Group uh, webpage. 
um, uh, and we also pin the actual presentation back into the event posting. So you can um, view them there as well. But they, they live here. If you see on the side, it'll say videos. Uh, that's where all our um, webinars remain. Also, I just wanted to make note, Virginia, I put on the, um, in the group chat there, your contact information, your website is there. So if people want to visit, you could see Virginia's website is, is there if they want to uh, talk to you a little bit more about this. So, um, all right, so a legal perspective. First and foremost, I just want to say it's really, really important that um, if you're in an abusive situation, and I know Virginia didn't talk about, um, you know, really um, sort of a domestic violence situation, but I'm, I'm sure it can go that way. So if you're in an abusive situation, you really want to first and foremost make sure that you're safe, make sure that your children are safe. If, obviously, if it's an emergency situation, get um, out of there, call the police. If it's not, you might want to consider um, a restraining order. Talk to your family law attorney about perhaps filing for a temporary restraining order. Uh, if you're being constantly harassed, uh, Virginia talked about cyberbullying. Uh, if you're being bullied or harassed online, if you're being threatened, if you're in fear, uh, consider a, a restraining order. Uh, again, your attorney can can guide you on the on the procedures for for doing that if it applies to you. Also, um, be honest with your ex uh, uh, about your ex with your attorney. Um, Virginia talked a little bit about finding somebody who's experienced in dealing with um, not only uh, high conflict divorces. Uh, but then naturally um, an attorney who's used to being in the courtroom on their feet litigating on your behalf. Um, if, if your attorney doesn't know um, how your ex can be or how narcissistic they truly are, then they're not going to develop a proper strategy uh, for the courtroom and they're not going to know how to handle the litigation appropriately. So if they're coming at your divorce, uh, from a mediation standpoint, from a collaborative divorce standpoint, uh, because they don't know truly how your ex is, then you're going to waste time and money litigating uh, because they're going to go down an avenue that's not appropriate for you. So really be honest with your, with your attorney. Don't forget, anything you say to your attorney um, is confidential. So, and nine times out of 10, and I can attest to this, uh, whatever you tell your attorney, they've heard it before. So always strive for complete honesty with your attorney. It's in your best interest. And we talked about court orders and custody orders, parenting time orders, and how important it is to stick to them. It's really important to stick to them because not only um, is it gonna bite you uh, because of your spouse's personality, um, but if you start to veer from a consent order uh, and things go bad, if you have to go back to court uh, the judge is going to say, why haven't you followed the consent order up until this point or my court order up until this point? Why did you change this uh, without putting it in writing or without coming back to court? So uh, stick to your court order. Uh, if your spouse or your ex-spouse is constantly violating a court order or violating your consent order, if you're so lucky to have a consent agreement, um, you may have to go to court to enforce those court orders. That might need more litigation. Again, we don't want to freak you out about costs and time and money uh, for court, but again, if your spouse is refusing to return the children uh, on time, because again, they don't think the rules apply to them, uh, and they're consistently two, three hours late, or they're missing, they're not doing their homework because your spouse won't you know, do that with them during their parenting time, you may have to go back into court uh, and file a um, notice of motion to enforce your rights under that under that order, so it's really important. And last thing I wanted to talk to you about uh, with regard to uh, the legality of this, we touched base on a little bit earlier. It's important that you put in or have put into your court order um, the greatest amount of specifics with regard to your situation as possible. So you wanna put in your pickup and drop off times. Don't just say pick up and drop off, you know, Friday and, you know, return, pick up on Friday, drop off on Sunday. No, you need to specify the place. You need to specify the time. You may even need to specify the person. If the two of you are such at odds that you're now having 
you know, your in-laws do the pick up and drop off, you need to specify that in an order as well. The more specific, the better. Um, because this way, again, if you have to go back into court, you have uh, a log that you've been keeping of the violations as proof for the judge so that enforcement can happen if it need be. What is enforcement? It could be um, a suspension of parenting time. Uh, it could be loss of custody. It could be paying your legal bills. Uh, there's a myriad of sanctions or penalties that the court can impose upon your ex for consistently violating um, orders of the court. Well, that's it for me. Virginia, do you have anything else you want to throw in there? I don't think so. Just again, thank you for having me on. Oh my God, thank you so much for being with me. Again, I'm sure we'll have you back on again. We'll talk about something else. Um, and don't forget everyone to subscribe to our Facebook events tab to be notified about upcoming live webinars. And again, if you wanna reach out to us, our toll-free number is 888-888-0919. You can reach out, schedule a consultation with us or visit us online at weinbergerlawgroup.com. There you will find uh, information not only about divorce, but about custody, domestic violence, uh, adoption, really any area of family law that you um, may need. And again, Virginia's information is on our uh, webpage here. Well, Virginia, before we go, let me just see, we have a, a question here from Tara. The court doesn't want to recognize domestic violence unless we go to trial. Domestic violence against the mom does not trickle down to DV to the children. Um, not sure I'm understanding 100% your question, Tara. Again, feel free to reach out to us or send us a direct message. But um, I, I think what you're saying is domestic violence against the mother in front of the children um, can be seen as abusive uh, or neglectful. So if any mom out there uh, is finding themselves in a situation where they're in a, in a violent or abusive relationship and the children are witnessing that, uh, you need to get your kids out of there uh, and get yourself safe. So I just wanted to hammer that home and, and talk to Tara a little bit there. 